God is good. Amen. Amen. God is good. We're so happy Easter, Real Life Church. It is a beautiful, sunny April spring day out there. I mean, that's what you were hoping for, right? Yeah, the, us too. But hey, we know that God controls all that, so he must have a plan that's bigger than ours. And so I'm going to be okay with it. If you're here today and you're a first-time guest or you're just somebody that maybe you, you come with family and you have a home church, we want to say thank you so much for coming and being with us today, giving us part of your day, uh, because I know it matters. I know this day matters to you. You're with your family. I pray that I'm a blessing to you and encouragement to you by the end of this. I hope so far you have felt welcome here at Real Life Church. If you're here, maybe you not don't have a home church. Maybe you're just trying this thing out. Like I said, legit, you heard there were donuts. And if that's why you came and you were hungry... Get more when you leave, all right? Get more when you leave. That's cool with us because then I won't be tempted to eat them. And uh, but I also want to say this: Thank you for giving us your time. You may be sitting there kind of wondering about this Jesus thing and why these people get so wound up when they hear about a beautiful name Jesus. Why we would say holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty? It seems a little wacky. Well, you're a little right, okay? And that's okay. But that may be just because you don't know him yet. And if you don't know him, man, I have an honor today. I get to introduce you to the guy that changes my eternity. And I'm excited for it. So if you have your Bible, turn with the book to the book of Luke. We're going to be in the last chapter of the book of Luke. And how many of you, let's just get this part out. How many of you know the Easter story? Hands up. Okay. If you don't know the Easter story, I'm going to give you a quick run through because we're going to actually talk about the story after the Easter story. Still happened on Easter Sunday or Easter on Resurrection Day. Still happened on that day. But it wasn't necessarily part of what we know. Because we know Good Friday is the crucifixion. Thursday night is the Last Supper. Jesus in the garden in between. The fake trial onto the cross. It is finished. Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The torture of the cross. The silent Saturday where everybody was confused. His followers, everybody. Heaven was quiet. Veil had been torn. Earthquake cleaning up around Jerusalem to Sunday morning. Sunday morning where we think, man, in our mind, like in my mind, I like to think that, man, everybody knew that he got up when he got up. Not everybody knew he got up when he got up. In fact, the Bible tells us in every account that it was just these ladies that walked, and the, the ladies went to the tomb to prepare him. They went to the tomb to get him ready for, for burial, for to actually take care of the body. And when they got there, there was an angel there that asked them a simple question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, just like he told you. I love angels. <laughs> he told you this. Why are you here? I think he might have been confused. But Jesus probably was like, no, sit here. They're going to show up. And... And so he says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. Just as he told you, he is risen. The ladies bolt back to the place where all the disciples are hiding because they're a little scared because the mentality of the disciples was, if they can get to Jesus, they can get to us. Because Jesus was the water walker. Jesus was, he was the grave robber. He was, he was the guy that brought life to the dead. He was the one that brought sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and, and walking to the paralyzed. He was that guy and, and we're just his followers. But if they can get to him, they can get to us. And so they were hiding. In fact, they stayed hidden. Most of the disciples, the Bible account really only registers one disciple being even at the cross. They didn't even go watch him die. Only John, only John was at the cross. And since he was at the cross, Jesus gave him a pretty heavy weight with Jesus' mother sitting there, standing there weeping, and he says, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. And he basically gives John the responsibility of taking care of his mom for him. And so the disciples are hiding. The ladies go to the tomb. They run back to the house. They say, hey, he's not there. There was an angel. The angel said he's not there. He rose just like he said he would. And the disciples all jumped up and ran. Nope. Only two of them did. Peter and John. Peter and John ran to the tomb. John beat him there to the tomb because in the gospel of John, John is very clear to let you know that John is the faster disciple also. John's my favorite disciple. I love Peter because I have my, I have my moments where I act, I act a little bit like old St. Pete. But uh, I, I, John is the one, man. That guy is, he's, he writes in the third person. You guys ever know anybody talked about themselves in the third person? 
It's kind of annoying. Like you see a lot of athletes do these and movie stars do this. It comes across as super arrogant when they do that. You know, it'd be like me standing up here going, now Vince Daniel wants to preach you a message. Can Vince Daniel preach you a message? Sounds horrible, right? I wouldn't do that. John does it through the whole gospel. He calls himself, but he doesn't even call himself by his name John. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. (laughs) There was Peter and James and Andrew and Nathaniel. Then there was the disciple Jesus loved, and it was him. I'm like, slick, John, slick. So, So they show up at the tomb, but again, he wasn't there when they show up. Tomb's empty. They went in to see where he lay. And so as great as it is for us looking back, knowing the rest of the story, there is still a large group of disciples hiding. They're still hanging out, still a little afraid of what's going on. So after all this goes down, some of them just make the decision, we're going home. We're going home. Two of them specifically, one named Cleopas, how many of you are glad that hasn't made it back in the baby book name thing? <laughs> Cleopas. And then he had a friend. We never get the friend's name, but these two guys start walking home. They start walking back to, the, to their community. is about seven miles outside of Jerusalem called Emmaus. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today, they can kind of, they think they can tell you where the, the village or the area of Emmaus was, but they're not even really sure. But you can get this account there that it was seven miles from Jerusalem. So they start this seven-mile journey from Jerusalem on Resurrection Day. Passover, is o- Passover, Sabbath is over, so now they can travel. So they're traveling on Sunday or this Resurrection Day. A little bit later in the day, they start their walk. And as they're talking, they're talking through the whole thing of, I, I just can't. It's, it's not the way it was supposed to go. Now, before we get into the text, how many of you have had a moment in your life or a thing in your life that once you got into it, you were kind of like, this isn't how this was supposed to go? And, and that could be anything. It could be really simple. Uh, maybe uh, if you've tried to cook something and about halfway through you go, this isn't how this is supposed to go. Maybe you bought a car and about three weeks in, the motor blows up and you go, wait, 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 this isn't how this was supposed to go. For some of you, it's a relationship, maybe even a marriage. And you're in it right now, and you're going, this isn't how this is supposed to go. And when it gets hard is when you have a decision to make. We know Cleopas and his friend were followers of Christ. We'll find out in the text here in just a moment that they were actually in the house with the disciples when the ladies got back. They were there. They were hanging out with the disciples. They knew them. They were intimate with them, followers of Jesus Christ. And it got hard because now Jesus was dead. So what do we do? So they went home. So they start this journey and and, and as they're walking along the way, somebody starts walking with them. The Bible will tell us, it says this was Jesus, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus starts walking with them and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they were like... (laughs) Are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know? He's like, what are you talking about? Well, we're talking about our friend G- th- these things that have all happened this weekend, and they, they didn't really get into his name just yet because they really weren't sure they could because who do we share this with? And finally, the stranger that's walking with them says, what things? And that's where we pick up in verse 19. And he, Jesus, said to them, what things are you talking about? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. A man who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now, if we stopped right there, it would be a pretty good setup for the gospel, wouldn't it? Like, I mean, if you and I are talking about Jesus and we're going to tell somebody how to be saved, this is a good setup. Jesus Christ, who was crucified, he was falsely accused and nailed on a tree. And and it was the religious people that did it. And we could preach. Boy, we could preach this right here. The problem is he doesn't stop talking. He doesn't stop talking. His next verse says, but... But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem us. 
Yeah, besides all this, now it's the third day since these things have happened. I want to sit on this verse for a second. But there's another but here in a minute. I was going to title the sermon, Get Your Butt Out of the Way. It's not going to work online. So I'm not going to do that. But that's what happened. The, these, these guys who had been with Jesus, they said, man, this is what he was. This is who he was. He was, he was recognized as a prophet. He was in good deed and good word. And, and the things he said were true. And the miracles were unbelievable. And, but it didn't turn out like we thought it would. It didn't go like we thought it would go. And, and, and besides, it's the third day. Now, if you don't know this, you study Jewish culture. Jewish culture would have believed that the spirit of a person hovers over the body for up to three days. And so if anybody had a seizure or went comatose or unconscious, and they didn't know what to do, they would just kind of step away. And if the, body, the spirit came back within a couple of days, a day or two, then it was considered that this person hasn't died. They, they just, their spirit had to take a breather. Now Jesus is beyond that. He's, he's, he's the third day. And they know it. It's the third day. So he's dead. He's, he's dead, dead. And we thought he was dead on the cross because he said it is finished. And that's what they told us because we weren't there. But he's, he's dead because it's the third day. And this is another thing you see. And if you know, if you study the Bible, if you heard, maybe heard the story of Lazarus. Lazarus in the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus waited till the fourth day. There's, it's, it's not by coincidence that he waited for the fourth day. It was so that there would be no doubt that when Jesus showed up and said, Lazarus, come forth, there was no spirit hovering by Lazarus. He was dead. That's why his sister said, uh, my favorite King James verse ever. He stinketh. That's great. That's great. I want that on a church t-shirt. He stinketh, Jesus. We're not moving the stone. Jesus said, move the stone. Lazarus, come forth. And four days dead, Lazarus rolls out of that dude. And that's what these guys know. They're going, no, it's, he's gone. He's dead. But we thought, we, we thought he was the redeemer. We thought he was going to be the one. And, 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 but this is what happened. Moreover, moreover, some women, some women went to the tomb they were in our company. And they amazed us because they were there at the tomb early this morning and they said he wasn't there. They, they said an angel showed up and talked to him. There's a little bit of doubt in their voice. Any of you know an emotional woman? Chickens. <laughs> it's okay. The first service got real bit out of shape when I asked that question. All right? But uh, it's okay because ladies, how many of you know an emotional man? Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. It goes both ways. And so we have this moment where these ladies came and told us, and, and two, of our, I mean, two of the guys went, Peter and John, the rest of us, we didn't go, but two of the guys went, and they got there. You'll see it. See what it says here as we jump in, verse 24. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said. But... They did not see him. But they did not see him. He, he was great, but we thought he was the redeemer. They said he rose, but nobody's seen a body. So, so we went home. We're heading home. And so then... I want to talk through just a couple things, and I'm not going to be long today, but I want you to hear this. Because these are guys that were with Jesus, okay? I need you to get this connection. They, they were in the house with the disciples, so they were with him. These would have been followers of Jesus, Cleopas and his friend. They would have been people that knew him, that, that were there for the miracles. They, they, they might not have been on the boat when he walked on water, but they were on the hillside when he fed the 5,000. They seen the woman with the issue of blood healed in the masses. They watched Jairus' daughter be restored. They watched the blind see the lame walk. They saw these things happen, and when it got hard... They walked home. 
And so I want to just give you this statement. As, as I was walking through this, it really kind of rung true with me as I started thinking through different scenarios and, and things that I've seen as a pastor. But this statement came to me and it's this. The ease of your walkout is a good definer of your buy-in. The ease that it is to walk away from something will tell me pretty quickly how much you had invested in it. It will tell me pretty quickly how much buy-in you actually had in the thing that you just walked away from. I see it all the time. Here we see it in these disciples that were like, well, it just got tough because the guy we thought was the guy is obviously not the guy, so we're going to go home. And maybe the reason this is the only place we read about Cleopas and his friend it's because they didn't offer him. I don't know, but what I know is that when it got hard, they rolled out. We see this at times when I, as a pastor, I get to visit with a lot of people. And so I have some very specific rules that people go, hey, we want you to do our wedding. And I'm like, okay, here's the deal. I'll, I, don't, I would love to do your wedding, but there are some standards that I have set, and so it keeps me out of a lot of weddings. They're like, what, what, is, what is it? What, what, what? And I go, well... Here's some standards. I have to meet with you in pre-marriage counseling or somebody that, that I know is going to meet with you in pre-marriage counseling before we get there. Okay, okay, great. Okay, I also have a standard that says this. Uh, if you're sleeping together, you have to stop. They're like, okay. And I said, and I may, let me make myself clear. If it is the night before your wedding and I find out you're sleeping together, you will have to find someone else the day of your wedding to do your wedding. I'm out. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I said, and last thing. If you already have your date set, I need the ability to change it. Because if we get in here and we talk and I find red flags and I need to move your date, then we need to do that. Do you know the most offensive question or the most pushback I get on any of my questions? The date. <laughs> no, it's got to be this day. It's got, it's got to be on this day. I've already, I've already got invitations made. I've already sent out cards. I've already done all the stuff. And I, it's that day. And I'm like, that's okay. I appreciate that. And I understand completely. I just need you to know that if we get in there and I find a red flag, if something comes up, I'm not saying you're not going to get married. I'm not saying I'm calling the whole thing off. What I'm saying is if we find something, it may be wise for us to move it until we figure out what that is. It, I'd, I'd rather put out the fire before we smell smoke. If, if I could, if that, but this is our date. Because let me, let me, I, now this is not something I would ever say in counseling, but I will say it to you. As a minister, I don't really care too much about your wedding. but I pray deeply for your marriage. Amen. And so I need to know you're bought in. I need to know that you're in it because I want that for you. I want, I want that for you. And so I have a lot of people push back because their buy-in is more to the date than it is their marriage initially. The moment, we're more, we're, man, we'll marry a moment. We love a good moment. The problem is we chase so many moments that we lose momentum in our relationships. This is not the sermon. This is all extra. It's not in my notes. So there. So be careful of that. And so you'll see it in other things. People will come to me. I'll have married couples come to me and they'll be just on the brink of divorce or, or they're separated now and they come in and they go, we just don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, how long has this been going on? About two years. <laughs> why, why, why? Why are, you just, why are you just coming now? Well, we thought we could figure it out. And you didn't? We're here. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Just give me a second. All right, let's start. And we dive in. And I love it. I love the fact that it's one of the things in ministry. But this whole idea of the ease of walking in or walking out will define how much you're bought in. Is a true statement in relationships. It's a true statement in people with church. Boy, I used to love my last church. What happened? They made me mad. Oh. <laughs> that was my favorite one, too. Because I'm like, you know we're a church, right? And they're like, yeah. There's a chance. There's a good chance. I'm going to make you mad. 
well, you haven't yet. Not yet. Give me time. I'm an overachiever. I could probably get there quick if you'll sit here for just a, you know, a few minutes. So. But we see it because people buy into this Christianity thing and they go, oh, I love my church until I don't love my church. And then I, I roll out of my church because I didn't love what they did. And then I go find another church. And guess what? They're going to do something because we're all packed in here with human beings. Some of you right now sit next to a person you've never seen before in your life and you're a little uncomfortable and you're going, I don't know if I like this or not. I don't know if I like And that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable with people you don't know. If you need a second, just high five the person, the new person next to you and go, hi, good to see you. Happy Easter. Nobody did it. See how uncomfortable you are? <laughs> People are like, mm -mm -mm. nope, 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 nope. Just preach, Vince, just preach. So, so the idea of our buy-in is a critical. You see this in the disciples. You see where Judas, his ability to take 30 pieces of silver really told us how bought in he is. But you can see his lack of buy-in throughout the gospel. You can see it when, when Mary breaks the oil to anoint Jesus' feet and Judas loses his mind over the money they just lost. Hey, this was worth some money. And Jesus is like, leave her alone. This She's preparing me for burial. I'm trying to show you what's getting ready to happen and you're missing it. Because you're not bought into the vision. You're not bought into what we're doing here. And you can see it throughout people. You can see it in the people around you. And it's easy. And so when we, when we think about the ease of our walking away from whatever situation, I know people, I've been Christian a long time. And here's the reality of my Christianity. It's seasonal. Can I just confess that to you? And, and you can be mad at me. It's okay. Well, I'm not saying that I ever walk away from it completely, but how many of you will amen with me and say, man, there's some seasons I'm hotter for Jesus than I am in other times. Yeah. Right? And so I, I struggle with this. And so sometimes if you were to ask me, hey, Vince, how bought are you, in are you? Man, I love Jesus. I love everything about Jesus. But sometimes I struggle staying close. And usually in those times when things get hard is where I act the fool and I don't trust Jesus. Because my walkout is connected to the level of my buy-in. Some people like to stay on the edge. They don't want to get too committed. I don't want to serve. I don't want, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to do anything. You know, I, I, because if I do, then, then I'm kind of committed. Yeah, that's how relationships work. You commit. You pray God's direction in it and his divine, divinity in it and you pray his blessing in it and, and see what happens. Does it always work? Not always. But that's up to God to decide and so we do that. So I want you to think, these disciples, they had buy-in but their level of buy-in, I don't know how deep it was because the moment it got hard, they rolled out. And here's the thing. It, how many of you have moments in your walk as a Christian where you go, man, if I was Jesus... If you don't, then I'm sorry for confessing this, because I do, and I would react a whole lot different than Jesus does. I just would, because I see Jesus here, and, and I'm reading what he does in this situation, because here's the situation. Jesus goes in, and he starts to tell them. He says, wait, 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 wait. No, wait. It, didn't it have to happen that way? He tells these two guys. He's, he's walking with them, and they just go through the whole butt list. But he wasn't the redeemer. But they didn't see a body. And Jesus goes, oh, listen, you foolish ones. Oh, you slow to believe. Didn't it have to happen like the prophet said? That, that it had to happen that way. And he's trying to urge them on. And when I first read this, and I read where he said, oh, you foolish ones, and you slow of heart to believe, I really, really wanted Jesus to be going, you idiots. Because <laughs> is anybody with me on that? That's how I would have been. Like, you guys were in the room. Jesus knew them, obviously, because he was Jesus, but Jesus knew them because they walked with him, and they don't recognize him right now. And he's going... And then God in his wisdom reminded me that I have kids. And he said, Vince, when your kids don't get it right, do you call them idiots? I'm like, do I really have to answer that, God? <laughs> no, I don't. 
uh, no. He said, sometimes they just do things because they don't know. And then I thought about it. I'm like, there's times my boys have done something. You guys have heard me tell a story about my boys, them running their younger brother up a pulley 50 feet into a tree tied to the back of a pickup truck. Boy stuff, fun stuff. And, and I come home and I go, you knuckleheads. You're going to figure it out one day. And it's almost as if God took me back to that moment and said, that's what I was saying to him. I wasn't beating him up. I'm like, but God, you, you could have beat him up. I mean, you told them specifically three times. Three times you told the disciples and everybody that was there, you said, this is what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me, beat me, crucify me, and bury me. But I'm going to come back. It was that clear. In fact, he had just told them a few days before this day. He said, hey, don't forget, I'm going now into Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me, they're going to crucify me, and I'm going to be put in a tomb, but I'm going to get up three days later. The other time is when he said, you go ahead and tear down the temple, in three days God will rebuild it. And so Jesus has told them this is going to happen, and they're going, but I don't guess he was who he said he was. But I don't guess, I, they didn't see a body. They didn't see a body. And so Jesus does what only Jesus can do. And Jesus does in this moment what you and I need Jesus to do every single day. All right? And it's a simple statement. Grace starts over. How many of you are so thankful that the grace of God starts over? Because I'm sitting here and I'm frustrated at Cleopas and his buddy. I'm, I'm really frustrated. And so I'm so, in, I'm God, I they know, they know, they know, they know, they know, but they just walked. They walked. Yeah, I know. I know. But keep reading. See what I did. And so it sees, he gets in there. And it, it says that, that he, he, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And they're like, yeah. And then he says this in verse 27, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted them in the scripture, the things concerning the Messiah. He says, guys, it was necessary for this to happen. Let's keep walking and let me teach you. And grace, he starts from the beginning again. He had just spent three and a half years pouring into the disciples. He had just spent three and a half years pouring into them. And, and, and now here he is after he'd just paid the ultimate sacrifice, done the ultimate thing that he came to do, and we still didn't get it. And what does Jesus do? Well, let's start again. You see, there was a prophecy that said there would come a day that they would bruise, heal. And that bruising just occurred on a cross. See, it was a bruise. It wasn't a death strike. I was damaged, but I wasn't done. And so now I got up. Why'd you get up? Because the rest of that prophecy in Genesis says that I'm going to crush the serpent's head. So there's still a battle to be won, and I'm not done fighting. And so he starts walking them through this without ever letting them know that it's him. Just reassuring them that, hey, hey, all that you just saw, all of it was on purpose. All that you just saw. Some of you right now, you need to remember that grace starts over in your life. That there's been things in your life that you may have not. Maybe it's been a while since you've been close to God. Maybe it's been a while since you've been close to God. And you're going, I don't know how to get back to him. Start over. Start the walk again. Start John 1, 9. says, if you, confess with you, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he's just to cleanse you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He'll, he'll wipe, it all out, wipe it away and let you start again. That's what Jesus does. And with Cleopas and his friend, that's what he did. He walked with them. And he just explained to them everything that's happening, everything that's happening. And in their hearts, they're starting to feel a little better about the walk. They get to Emmaus and Jesus is like, fellas, I'm going to roll on. Good to see you. No, 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 no. It's late. Sundown's coming. 
Just stay with us. Stay with, please stay with us. Don't go. Just stay with us. Let's continue the conversation. This is really critical. They invite him in. And they set a table. And Jesus sits at the table. Interestingly enough, if you were to go visit someone's house, the head of the house would be the one who served. But in this story, that's not what happens. He comes into the house. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. He gone. He's gone? Yeah, he's gone. He just needed them to know that it was him. He just needed them to know that everything we just had to talk about, guys, that was just me encouraging you. It's me letting you know it's going to be all right. It's me letting you know that I am alive. And it took that breaking of the bread, but it was more than that. Because some, I don't know about you, but I, I'm a, I've been a Christian. I've been a pastor for 20 years. And I've been a Christian for longer than that. But I can tell you throughout my Christian walk and even my life before I said yes to Jesus, I used to see Christians man, I'd see these Christians like every part of their life was like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I'm like, what are you on? How do you do that? And then I was frustrated because I knew Jesus. I knew the stories. I knew the songs. I knew John 3, 16. I mean, I, I, mean, I knew it, but I didn't have it like that. I, 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 felt like I, I felt like I was close. Anybody with me on this? We're like, you feel like you're close sometimes, but... But then there's that person that's like living up here. And doesn't matter what you say, no matter what you say, they've got like the perfect Bible verse for it and you want to punch them in the face. <laughs> is, is anybody with me? I, if you just leave me hanging on this, I'll, I, it's okay. I'll preach the sermon to myself. But the reality is sometimes I'm there and I'm like, God, I don't feel as I'm, as, I'm like I'm close as I could be to you. I feel like that I know about you but I don't know that in this season that I know you. And I'm going to tell you right now, today's church, Big C, is full of people that know about Jesus, but don't know him. They don't know the presence. They don't know the presence. You see what happens here. There's something different. These two guys were stirred in their hearts going, man, this has been good. It's been good to talk about Jesus. It's been good to hear about the prophecy again. It's been good to be reminded about Jesus, about Jesus, about Jesus. And because they had been close enough to hearing about Jesus, they made an invitation. Would you come in? Would you sit with us? Would you come in and would you sit with us? Yeah, I'll come in. And he sits down at the table, and when he breaks the bread, it all becomes clear. He's vanished. And all of a sudden, Cleopas and his friend look at each other, and they start talking. They're going, hey, didn't our hearts burn within us? When he started talking, didn't you get a little fired up? I got fired up. I don't know if you did or not. Cleopas is like, I got way fired up. I don't know. I hope you did, because I can feel it. I know what's going on. Now I know it's him. I got to tell somebody. They get up from the table, seven miles back to Jerusalem, they go. Immediately, it says, immediately they got up, and I promise you the seven miles the second time went faster. They got up, headed back to Jerusalem. They go to the place where the disciples are hidden, and they bust through the door. It's real. It's real. He's he's alive, just like Peter said, just like the lady said. He's alive. And everybody in the room stops and goes, wait, 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 what do you mean? We mean he's alive. We saw him. We know it's him. How do you know? I love this. I love this part. Then they told what had happened on the road. Now, look, telling them what happened on the road wasn't how they knew. No, how they knew it was him 
is when he broke the bread. It's when he got one-on-one -on -one with him. It wasn't this. It was me and you. It, it wasn't the crowd. It wasn't the traffic on the road. It was, it was me and it was you. It was me and it was you, Joe. It was Jesus and Vince. It was Jesus and Cleopas at that moment because they had invited him in and things broke open. You want intimacy with God? Do you want presence of God in your life? You want to know what it's like to know him and not know about him? Because there is a huge difference. There's a difference between being a fan and being a follower. There's a difference. And the difference is the invitation. How often are you letting him in? How often are you asking him in to break the things in your life that need broken? The stuff that's, that's there. He's, uh, Vince, I mean, I got some stuff, but you know, it's good. I can handle it. No, 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 stop. The moment you start thinking you can handle it, it will end up not being what you thought it would be. The moment you think you can handle it, you'll recognize the limited buy-in you have to who Jesus Christ really is. Because he didn't say, cast the cares that you can not handle on me. He said, cast your cares on me because I care for you. And just like these men, there's another place in scripture where Jesus is telling this story. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone, if anyone would open the door and allow me to come in, I will come in and I will sup with him. That word sup is to break bread. I will come in and I will break up the things needed in your life. I will feed you what you need. I will sustain you like you need. But he is a gentleman, church. He is a gentleman. And he is not kicking down the door of your heart. He is not going to force himself in. He is not going to do that. He's going to stand outside the door and he's going to knock. Some of you have heard him knock. Some of you have walked in and out of a relationship with Christ. You have been close to him and far away and close to him and far away. And I'm here to tell you today that grace is willing to start over if you are. For some of you, you've, you've never been in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You showed up today, like I said, because you got a card and some donuts were stuck on the wall. And if so, praise God, I hope they were great. I hope your nap from the sugar coma is fantastic this afternoon. But more than all of that, you are not here on accident. You are here because God's grace didn't want to start over in your life. It wanted to start now in your life. And he wants to redeem you from the past. He wants to forgive you of the sin. He wants to be standing at the door. If you'll open it, I'll come in. If you'll allow me, I'll walk in and I'll change everything. I've been praying all week long. I said, God, I want somebody's eternity to start Sunday. I want somebody's eternity to start Sunday. We had people in the first service say yes. We had people Friday night say yes. I didn't even do an invitation Friday night. Somebody, we were picking up in the connect cards on your seat. And I started to, before I was throwing them away, I was looking at them. And as I walked through, we picked up four cards. Two of them said, tonight, I said yes to Jesus Christ as my Savior. Why? Because Jesus Christ is constantly knocking because he wants the grace to start in your life. He's saying, here I am, and I've got it all. You need peace? I've got peace. You need joy? I've got joy. You need strength? I've got it. You need power? I've got it. You need it. And what do you need? I will supply all of it according to my riches in heaven. Why? Why would he, Pastor Vince, why would he do that for me? Because you're you. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Christ. And there is no one like you on this planet. And from the moment you were conceived, God had a plan for you. And it's a good plan. It's a great plan. And he says, if I can just get my people to come and see the plan. 
If I could just get him to come and open the door and I'll tell him the plan. If they'll just open the door and I can tell him the plan, they won't want anything else. But they won't stop long enough to hear the plan this morning. Stop long enough. Open the door. Hear the plan. He's calling you. He's knocking on your heart's door right now. I want you to bow with me, church, if you would. I know it's Easter. We're supposed to throw down and preach about Resurrection Sunday. Well, we did. I know why Jesus got up from the grave. So I would have hope for tomorrow. I would have victory over death. I would know there's an eternity that waits for me and I get to go there because he's going to take me. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Even his leaving was for me. His cross was for me. The empty tomb was for me. His ascension is for me. And he's coming back for me. And for you.